The government insists that it is safe for children and staff to return to schools in June. We can make these workplaces safe. You can never eliminate risk, but if for any reason uh, uh, there are risks, then we can take steps to mitigate them. But as people around England make the most of the new lockdown rules today, questions too over whether government's plans should vary across the country. The issues that we will face in different places will, will vary, and the government needs to have a way of recognising that. Also, Barack Obama launches his first public attack on Donald Trump's handling of the coronavirus. This pandemic has fully, finally torn back the curtain on the idea that so many of the folks in charge know what they're doing. A lot of them aren't even pretending to be in charge. And the new reality of having a baby during lockdown. ITV News with James Mates. Good evening. As the row over the reopening of schools rages on, Michael Gove today stood firm, stressing it is safe for children and staff to return in June. He said protection measures were in place, but did admit that not all of the risks of COVID-19 infection could be eliminated. His defence of the government's plan is in response to some councils and teaching unions warning it's still too dangerous to go back. And the mayor of Greater Manchester says that there should be a different strategy for the north as cases remain higher there. Our political reporter Shihab Khan has more. With the sun out, many here in Norfolk have started to make the most of the new slightly eased lockdown measures. The government has started to relax some of its rules, so people can now go visit beaches and parks as long as they socially distance. The next plan is to start reopening schools in a few weeks' time, and today government ministers insisted it was safe to do so. The key thing is uh, that we can make these workplaces safe. You can never eliminate risk, but as we know, as we've heard, um, it, it is the case that it's extremely unlikely um, that uh, any school is likely to be the source of a, a, a COVID outbreak. Okay. Um, and, and if for any reason uh, uh, there are risks, then we can take steps to mitigate them. The current plans are for certain year groups to return to school on June 1st. Some teaching unions are concerned this is too soon and that it's not safe for staff or students. Amir Awan's father died of COVID-19. He is a parent in Birmingham and will not be sending his children back to school before the summer holidays. I have lost someone who's very dear to me, uh, and not just to myself, but to, to the whole community of Birmingham, because my father was a community man. Um, but, you know, we've lost other people in our community. Now, why don't we just wait? What's, what's the urgency of sending the kids back to school and having that second spike? Because there will inevitably be another spike. Why take that risk? Councils in Liverpool and Hartlepool have said they won't be following the government's advice. They argue it is too soon to be opening schools. The North East, we're about two to three weeks behind um, London and, and certain places further south. So for us, the 1st of June isn't the right time, uh, but we are working uh, more detailed plans to um, create a staggered return. As regional differences in the response to the pandemic emerge, there have been accusations of a London-centric approach to easing the lockdown measures. I'm not seeking to, as I say, undermine uh, the government's message nationally, but I am asking people to, to think about the particular level of risk uh, here and to tend towards the cautious side of things. The conversations and debate about the best time and way to ease more of these lockdown measures will inevitably continue, but the government will hope that some consensus can be formed soon. And Shiab is here. Now, the government has also announced today more money for vaccine development. What can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so the government had previously invested £47 million into two programmes, one at the University of Oxford and the other one at Imperial College London. And today they've announced a further £84 million. Now, we're told that the clinical trials at the University of Oxford are going well and that Imperial was set to start their clinical trials next month. Now, the process and speed at which this is happening is unprecedented. It usually takes us much longer to get to this point. Now, today, at the daily press conference, the business secretary, Alok Sharma, gave us this update about upscaling a potential vaccine. If the vaccine is successful, AstraZeneca 
will work to make 30 million doses available by September for the UK as part of an agreement at over 100 million doses in total. The UK will be first to get access. Now, it's important to remember we don't know if these trials are going to be successful. And as the Prime Minister said last week, there is no guarantee that we ever get a vaccine. But for now, let's keep an eye on these trials. Yeah, well, let's hope so. Yeah, thanks so much indeed. Former US President Barack Obama has criticised the Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus crisis for the second time in a week, this time publicly in an online address to graduating students. In the last few minutes, President Trump has angrily reacted to the criticism, dismissing his predecessor as grossly incompetent. Robert Moore has the latest. The president has been out of view since Friday, when he left the White House for a rare weekend at Camp David. But for the last 48 hours, he has been tweeting furiously, frequently promoting a conspiracy theory that Barack Obama was directly involved in an attempt to sabotage his presidency. But Trump's predecessor, for so long silent, has now obliquely returned fire in a video message to graduating students. Do what you think is right. Doing what feels good, what's convenient, what's easy, that's how little kids think. Unfortunately, a lot of so-called grown-ups, including some with fancy titles and important jobs, still think that way, which is why things are so screwed up. And Obama highlighted the economic anguish playing out across America. Even families that are relatively well off are dealing with massive uncertainty. Those who were struggling before, they're hanging on by a thread. That is something we saw for ourselves in recent days in Baltimore, one of America's most economically distressed cities. Thousands of families here are relying on food banks and on charity. And yet even among the most disadvantaged, we found sympathy, even support, for President Trump. He's doing the best he can. I mean, I can't imagine anybody being prepared for this. I think all in all, he's doing a pretty good job. Um, He's a businessman, he approaches it like that, and I'm fairly pleased. Would you, vote fairly for him? pleased. Would you vote for him in November? Definitely. I think he's doing the best he can do. You know, the way things are with him. So you don't blame the president or the White House for any of this? No, definitely not. President Trump has frequently attempted to blame others, including Obama, for America's lack of preparation. President Obama left us no ammunition, okay? And he left us virtually no medical and ventilators. He left us, the cupboard was dry, right? The cupboard was dry. This blame game between President Trump and his predecessor will not help the response to the pandemic. But it does reflect the reality that a presidential election is less than six months away. And swirling all around it will be this toxic blend of recriminations, accusations, and conspiracy theories. Robert Moore, ITV News, at the White House. A group of MPs is describing the HS2 rail network as badly off course. A report by the Public Accounts Committee raises new concerns about the transparency and handling of the project. The group, which examines the value for money of government, says public confidence in the programme has been undermined. And inventor Sir James Dyson has topped the Sunday Times annual rich list for the first time. His wealth grew by £3.6 billion in the past year. According to the paper, Britain's wealthiest 1,000 people have lost more than £54 billion because of the coronavirus. The usual worries of parents approaching the birth of their child are being heightened. By the changes brought about by the coronavirus, home births have been cancelled, along with some birthing plans and face-to-face postnatal visits. For some expectant mums and dads, that's leading to more fear and more uncertainty. Lucy Watson has more. This is the nursery. Rochelle Pemberton is preparing to bring her new son into the world in five weeks' time. Have the hospital bag ready to be packed. But she never imagined giving birth in the midst of a pandemic, a pandemic that's changed how maternity services can operate. There is more concern about um, baby's safety. It's very up and down days, sort of trying to cope with everything and sort of control 
control the worries. Because of COVID-19, partners are not allowed at scans or to attend the birth if they have symptoms or are vulnerable. Many home births, antenatal classes and some planned C-sections have been cancelled. It's a desperately difficult situation to be in as, as a medic of any sort because of the fact we just want to help everyone. But essentially at the moment we are having to prioritise and, and make excruciatingly difficult decisions. Does anybody have a question with regards to Corona? Deprived of normal social networks means many couples are going online for advice. Louise Broadbridge is a midwife taking virtual antenatal classes. Since the lockdown started, I've now taught uh, over 1,500 couples. I've probably been working 12-hour days every day. If we hadn't have had technology, I think we would have, been, we would have seen far more mental health implications for, for new couples. More than 116 million babies worldwide are likely to be born under the shadow of COVID-19, a virus that's straining health services and medical supply chains, but also recasting motherhood. Lucy Watson, ITV News. Before we go, a reminder that if you have any questions, we can answer them in our weekly interactive programme, Coronavirus Q&A. On Monday, the guests will be Mark Drakeford, the First Minister of Wales, and Susan Mickey, a sage government advisor, on how people behave in lockdown. So, if you have a question, please email it to coronavirus at itv.com, use the social media hashtag coronavirusqa, or call 0333 015... 1128 and leave a voicemail. That's at 8 o'clock on Monday here on ITV. That's it. I'm back at 10. Till then, have a good evening.